for them to see. The audience uh, can see the slides and the doctors. I can notice there's a bit of lag when you start broadcasting, you know. Leo. All right. All right, on your mark, uh, Gary, anytime. All right, hello, hi. Is everybody in here? Hello. I can hear you, Gary. Yeah. Oh, you can hear me. All right, great. I think everybody is on board. Hi, a very good morning and uh, greetings to all colleagues. I'm Gary. I'm a practicing cardiologist uh, from uh, an electrophysiologist from Thompson Hospital. Uh, I think in the midst of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, not only awareness of personal hygiene and uh, health increased, I think the numbers of online lectures and also webinars have increased tremendously. And as we begin to move forward to the end of the phase four of the MCOs, uh, we have started to advocate public to adapt to new normal of, in their daily activities. I think similarly for us as doctors as well, we too have to embrace the era of digital learning uh, as the new norm, right? So a big shout out and thank you to Severe for being able to gather all of us here today uh, for today's talk. Cardiac EP in Everyday's Practice, the web series session three. It always gives me great pleasures, you know, to chair this session, especially when I know the speaker is no, none other than Dr. Ma Su King, the consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist from uh, Lo Guan Lai Special Center in Penang, up north there. Uh, not only because the place is a nice state to be in, the food definitely, and also, of course, you have a nice speaker who is uh, Dr. Ma himself as well. He's no stranger to many of us, both local as well as regional and also international scene, has always been a great teacher, mentor and a close friend, even to me myself. So living up to this expectation, he has always been an avid ECG person. For those who have been to his talk, you know, you will never be disappointed. But certainly he always leave you leaving the room hungry for more of him as well as his ECG talks. So his achievement will take days to list them out. I'm definitely not going to take up his precious time, but I will let this talk showcase the man himself as he bring us to uncover the mystery of ECGs in today's talk. A cue, an uncanny tea, and a fistful of suspense. Over to you, Dr. Ma, to elevate us from this moment of suspense. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gary, for the warm uh, introduction. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the season three of uh, EP in EP series, Cardiac Electrophysiology in Everyday Practice. Uh, this season is a bit suspenseful, uh, a cue and a canny tea and a fistful of suspense. Let's get right into it. Now, nothing to disclose. We all know this. We have been dealing with this graph of voltage over time. For many many times we give them names of certain spots in this graph the p wave the q wave the r wave the s wave and the t wave we all know this and we as scientists and doctors like to give more names more names means good right we give them names like the st segment and we give them names like the pr interval and just like everything in everything else in life uh, there are superstars when you have a group of uh, uh, things been lumped together. Having a superstars in a group of things, then you have the underdogs. So I used to say that the superstar of all these intervals and the waves is none other than the ST segment. Correct or not? ST segment is one of the most discussed intervals on the ECG. Now, I'm not going to talk about ST segment, obviously. But in the process of uh, elevating the status of the ST segment, somehow or rather we, we tend to neglect certain things, right? There are two things at least I think it's been neglected, ne neglected all this while. First is a QT interval. I call this the forgotten interval. And the P wave, I call this the underappreciated wave. And also there are at least other two things that confuse us, if not all the time, most of the time. The first is the Q wave. 
or we call it if you have a q wave then you had a heart attack before it's called a post mi wave q wave is almost synonymous to a patient had a heart attack and the t wave we call it the, the ischemia wave because t wave inversion means ischemia but is that correct we're going to examine this today and first things first before talking about what is a Q wave, we need to define what is a pathological Q wave. What defines pathology here? Because we know the Q wave can be normal and physiologic in some patients. Now, there are numerous criteria in Q wave definition, but I like this one. This one is called a classical definition. Well, if your Q wave is more than one small box wide, and more than 25% depth deep of the, the height of the following R wave, then is pathological. Now, just to illustrate that, uh, that point, look at here. The thumbs up here is a physiologic Q wave, a tiny Q wave. It's less than one small box and it's less than 25% of the following R wave in the same lead. On the other hand, look at the name. The, the red one. This is a pathological Q wave. It has the duration of more than one small box, 40 milliseconds, if you want to know duration. And the depth of the Q wave is definitely more than 25% of the following R wave in the same lead. Now, how about the ischemia wave? Now, the T wave is the most one, the most elusive one. I'm not going to talk about the criteria of defining pathology. Instead, I'm going to tell you this. On the other way, on the other hand, any T wave inversions beyond lead to V2 is considered abnormal. Now, there's an asterisk here. If you know this fact, layer out the knowledge, then you can have the next layer of knowledge here. Men's and, men and women, we are different. TV inversion in V3 can still be normal in female. That's the fact. Now, enough of didactics on definitions. Let's go into a case. 38 year old man, no, no medical illness. He has come to you for pricking chest pain for two weeks. You've examined him normal. He did give a history of his late grandfather passed away due to heart disease at the age of 69. Now, I want you to look at this ECG span about five to 10 seconds. Obviously, the theme for today is Q and uncanny T. Of course, I want you to pay attention to any Q waves and T waves. With, uh, after five seconds, I'm gonna pull you. In fact, I'm gonna show you the option and come back to the ECG. The options are, what do you think? Is it normal ECG? You give it a pass. Or you think there are Q waves in the inferior leads, you need to investigate further. Or you think there are subtle Brugada patterns, just like I said in season one, then you need to investigate further. Or you think straight away, well, wow, this is acute inferior ST elevation MI, emergency. Okay, People please pull. Polling. Yeah, good. It's a moment of suspense, just like your title of talk also. Yeah, <laughs> yes. It's still moving. All right. All right. Seems to be like the Q wave in inferior leads and investigate further option is leading at this point of time. Uh -huh, yeah. But uh, I think the normal ECG is coming up soon. Yeah, but a lot of people say normal ECG. I, I must say that I am really mesmerized by this result. <laughs> All right. All right. I think the normal ECG and pass will be the uh, wow. highest voted normal ECG option. Pass are actually highest, uh, very good. Okay, good, great. Then next poll is, with the answer in mind, what would you do? Would you subject the patient for a coronary angiogram emergently? Would you want to initiate antiplatelet therapy because you're worried about Q waves post MI? Or you want to do provocative tests, for example, a sodium channel blocker like flaconite to bring out the Brugada pattern even more, if you think it's Brugada? Or you want to wave a magic wand? Please pause. A 
I think the audience know my style already, so now they know the answer. Not bad. Yeah. Everyone is looking for that magic one <laughs> to decipher the ECGs. Mm. Magic one winning? Yep. Yeah. In fact, it's the highest, near to 60% voted for that. Great. Let's move on. Okay. The issue is, trust me, I've calculated for you. Now, I've defined what is a pathological Q wave in the beginning for you all. The Q wave in lead three in this patient is at 26%. Trust me, I calculated for you. So it's more than 25. And the width of it, uh, skinny, but maybe encroaching 30 to 40 milliseconds. But definitely the depth of the Q wave is worrying. Now, this is one of the reasons of the referral because Q waves in inferior leads owe inferior MI. I feel that it's incomplete by just saying that this is a normal ECG without making the Q wave in lead 3 disappear. That's why I use a magic wand. Now, this is what happened when I use a magic wand. I wave the magic wand and voila. You can see that the Q waves from being significant, so-called fulfilling criteria have been pathological, slowly becoming non-pathological and become almost disappeared. What did I do? I just asked the patient to take a deep breath. Deep inspiratory maneuver during ECG acquisition is the trick to make the so-called Q wave disappear in it three especially. So, but it doesn't take away the suspense though. Why are Q waves potentially problematic? It's because of this. This does not belong to the same patient. It's from a different patient. Look at the inferior leads here. These are pathological Q waves, guys. Look at inferior leads. The Q waves are ugly, it's very deep, and it's definitely more than 100% of the array on the same lead. That's why I want to introduce you, introduce the idea, what I call as a buddy features. If you think this patient has a MI before, is an OMI, which has a Q wave, always look for these buddy features. Look for diminished array amplitude on the same lead. And most of the time, because of post MI, you will have some T wave inversion in the same leads. This is a classic post inferior MI Q waves. So I'm not saying that Q waves are normal. I'm just saying that Q waves in some patients can be physiologic. Look for the body features and institute the correct clinical care. Pay attention to the R wave and also T wave inversion on the same leads. The implications to our everyday practice is, although we define Q waves electrically by this criteria, 25% of the R wave, more than that is pathological, but indeed and truly, the diagnosis of a pathological Q wave, the complete one, should be a clinical one. Means that we need to take in context of patients totality of clinical profile. If you want to wave the magic wand, which the trick I always do, ever since I was a very junior consultant in the hospital, I always wave the magic wand and say, you see the QV disappear. So it's not a patient with an O inferior MI. Let's go to the next case. The next case is one of my favorite. I should spend a bit more time on this patient. 19 year old girl, quite pretty girl. <laughs> no known medical illness. About to go to college. The reason why he comes, he came to see you is because he wants you to solve her old problem for many, many years. She has been having yearly palpitations. Now, yearly. Uh, now, the word yearly uh, keeps a lot of, uh, of my colleagues away. So, wow, yearly, once a year is okay. But yearly, he has been having palpitations since the age of 11. And he, she said, it usually happens after I exercise a lot, but sometimes it just happens out of nowhere. You know, 
while well, resting at home, watching TV it happens also. But it's not so often. It's once a year, maybe twice a year. But uh, okay, but now I'm going to college. I felt that every time it happens, my heart want to jump out. And the parents is really, really worried because the daughter is going to college and they're worried that one of these days the heart jump out and just stop. And the patient come to you basically for you to solve her problems. Now, no syncope, okay? The patient didn't fail during palpitations. The background of the history also further is she also saw multiple physicians. Uh, physicians say that while well, you are growing up, puberty, huh? uh, you will outgrow your symptoms after puberty, don't worry. He saw, uh, she saw two uh, of my colleagues, cardiologist colleagues over the years. She has been extensively investigated, all results told to be normal. Stress tests, echoes, multiples of them. Holters and I don't know, a bit six or seven of Holters recording, all normal. She even had a CT angel done, which turned out to be normal, which I think is an overkill in this case. Now, she has come to you for 11th opinion. 11, you are Dr. 11. So what would you do? Of course, you examine her, right? Look at her, examine her, normal. Physical examination, perfectly normal. Of course, the next step is do an ECG. And this is her ECG. I want you to look at this ECG for five to 10 seconds and we'll go for the polling. Now, obviously the theme for today is the Q wave and uncanny T, means the ugly T. So we shall pay attention to any Q and T waves here. And we quickly go to the next poll. Diagnosis, and what would you do? First option, nah, normal ECG, just like the first case, pass. Puberty, after puberty, you should be okay. Or you think there's isolated Q in three. You want to wave the magic wand, like what I did for the first case. Or you think it's O inferior MI. Start antithrombotic therapy. Or you think it's WPW syndrome, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. You want to call in the finite to refer for EP study and RF ablation. Please vote. I think over the years, the MHRS has been doing a very good job. Seems like the, the yeah. option of EP study and RF ablation is topping the poll now. Well, but I always say that you need to make us happy. If you think <laughs> otherwise, please let uh, us know. Right. Good. I think uh, majority. Almost, of yes, majority. Audience, I think majority is like 82%, 83% say, call in the finite. It is WPW syndrome. Now, I need to congratulate all my audience here, but there is, there is something even more suspenseful here, which I'm going to review now. Yes, the finite did induce her SVT during EP study. Now, I'm going to restrain myself now not to belabor too much of this ECG because for the EP folks, this, this ECG we can discuss for hours. Sometimes we argue over it. Difficult ECG. Now, suffice for me to say that, take it from me this SVT, but this is a weird type of SVT. Really, really weird type of SVT. It's almost like VT is a broad complex tachycardia, man. So I should restrain myself. Trust me, it's an SVT and we move on. But it begs one really suspenseful question here. Hey, Dr. Ma, what are you talking here? You're talking about WPW syndrome. Don't bully me. Like, I don't think I, I don't, don't know this man. WPW sure got delta wave and short PI interval. And we got short PI interval and delta wave in this ECG. I, can, I can't even see a delta wave. And the PI interval is normal. Well, I totally agree with you. That leads us to talk about what is a normal condu cardiac conduction system and how a particular wave, especially a wave in lead three, limb lead three is being generated. Now, of course, the heart command center is an SA node. The SA node fires. It travels across the atrium, engages the AV node and goes across the his bundle and goes down to the Pagigi fibers. Now we have the left bundle and the right bundle. 
Usually it goes down into both the bundle almost at the same time. But you notice one thing that because the right and left bundle is in the septum, so naturally, no matter how fast they conduct, the septum is going to be activated first. Now imagine the electrical wavefront travels down to the right bundle. From the center, it spreads out outward to the lateral wall of the RV. Lead, limit three, is the lead that look from the outside of the RV in. So if you have an electrical wavefront that carries the activity coming towards you, you should record a net net electrical forces being positive. This is point number one. Now, what if you have a special, special form of accessory pathway that conducts slower than a normal pathway, doesn't cause a short PI interval, doesn't cause a delta wave, but this accessory pathway connects the atrium straight into the right bundle, right bundle branch. Now you can see the yellow band here, straight into the right bundle branch. So it gained access to the right bundle branch earlier than the electrical impulses that passes through the AV node. What happens now? Because now I can gain access to the right bundle earlier, I pre-excite the right bundle earlier. Now, the net electrical forces now from the RV is going away from lead 3. Now, lead 3 has become negative, the net, net electrical forces, like a Q wave here. No one will argue this is not a Q wave. It's because the right bundle has been pre-excited or been depolarized earlier than it should be. Now, ECG post radio frequency ablation, ladies and gentlemen, look at lead three. Now, the net electrical forces has been restored to normal C. Look at the dominant R wave now. This should be a normal electrical wavefront that carries depolarization from the center outward and keeping the limb lead tree right on. So, ladies and gentlemen, after the ablation in two, year 2016, uh, I, I last saw her physically, you know, in person one year ago because uh, she just came back from her college break. Uh, no recurrence. She's okay. Uh, last phone call three months ago, also, she's been doing fine. One thing she's very happy about is, doctor, I can now go for any sports I want. No more symptoms of palpitation. Last time, I used to think that I over-exercise. That's why I dare not do a lot of exercise. In fact, to the extent that I want to rest most of the time. Now, this is very important because often we say that SVT don't kill. Yes, SVTs, they usually don't kill. But it causes significant morbidity, as in it takes away life from that patient. Imagine you think that exercise actually causes you to have SVT, hence you restrict yourself doing a lot of things. This we must restore in the patient's life. Implications to everyday practice, ladies and gentlemen. Although traditionally we call an isolated Q wave in lead 3 as being a normal variant, but listen to the patient, if they have palpitation, we should be alert for that it may be a manifestation of a special form of pre-excitation syndrome or WPW, which can be treated successfully with near 100% success rate with ablative therapy. I think this case, honestly, when I discussed this case with my colleague, he said that, wow, my, you are good. Huh? You just diagnose a, a, a WPW or pre-exciting syndrome based on one lead? Well, you are super. I said, no, no, actually, no. The lead gives me clue. But what is more important is patient symptoms, patient history, which is there's no magic here. Listen to patient symptoms. Distinctive episodes of unprovoked palpitations always suggest organic causes. Guys, be mindful about that. You treat the patient, you spare the patient a long quest 
for a cure. And by doing that, you're really doing a patient a great favor. Hey, Dr. Ma, do you think we Thanks. can take a question from one of the okay, of audience? Yeah, sure. Before before see, yeah. Someone's mentioning about, can it be a wrong lead, lead placement? That account oh, someone me? is saying the wrong lead placement. Huh? Mm. Okay, asking whether Good. is it possible? Okay, if it's wrong lead placement, then you need to have other leads which are out of place as well. Let's go back to that ECG and look at it. That's a very good thought. Okay. Which lead do you think that has been wrongly placed? I mean, obviously, you can't wrongly place only one lead. There should be a lead to lead reversal. If you replace lead two to lead three, uh, you can explain also why lead two is negative all the way. Okay, then you say that I think I replaced a uh, uh, limb lead AVR, which is usually negative anyway, with lead three. But look at limb lead AVR, it's still negative. So there is no other accompanying features like what I call body features to suggest uh, lead reversal because you need two lead to be reversed. You either omit one lead and you reverse two leads, right? Or multiple leads. You can have only one lead being replaced. It doesn't work this way. Um, but this is a very good thought. I mean, uh, by looking at this, I didn't even thought of re limit reversal, but this is a good thought. Really good question. Thank you very much. Any more burning questions before I move on to the third case? Uh, we can, probably can go on with the next. Yeah. Sure. All right. Now, third case is another of my challenging uh, case, which I've managed uh, uh, the past one year. It surprised me as well. 33-year-old lady came to your clinic. Imagine she, she's a patient uh, complaining of uh, only one symptoms. In Hokkien, is Eng Chuan. Eng Chuan means reduce effort tolerance, easily get tired. Six months away, six months ago, yeah. No, 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 uh, no other known medical illness. You examine her, everything is fine. Blood pressure, pulse rate is okay. No pedo edema. JP is, yeah, yeah, okay. Not raised. But the only thing that you find that is that the apex seems to be displaced, but you're not sure. And of course, you did ECG on the patient, and you find this. Now the topic for today is Q wave and T wave. Of course, I want you all to pay attention to any Q and any uncanny T, ugly T. As you can see here, there are a lot of uncanny T's, ugly T's flying around on this ECG. Now look at this ECG and uh, poll next. What do you think? Sinus freedom, next case. No bother. Maybe there's some ST elevation in lead one and AVL, electro MI. ACS, which is synonymous. I mean, I should say T wave inversion, T wave inversion used to be synonymous with ACS. Long QT syndrome, none of the, none of the above. Let's see the poll result. Mm, still coming, yep. Yep. I think the, uh, I'm between long QT and none of the above. I'm so bit surprised that uh, the crowd is getting smarter and smarter. When I was last, I polled uh, another group of audience, uh, there was 90% saying that it's ACS. Which is not wrong, actually, to be honest. Because mm. TV inversion is the ischemia wave. Uh, yeah. I learned that uh, from housemanship, when I was an MO, medical MO, and cardiology MO, even when I was a uh, cardiology fellows in training, uh, I was told that TV inversions means ischemia. I think more so when nowadays you're getting younger and younger patients with uh, ischemic yeah, heart disease. Yeah. It's a big Correct. concern. Correct. I think the poll Correct. is kind of, everyone is pointing towards long QT, but the one coming up okay. was uh, none of the above. Yeah. yeah, Because knowing me, I think they know me already. <laughs> they say this ma. Would that give us a simple diagnosis one? I better choose something more exotic. <laughs> All right, good. Whatever you choose is correct. All right. A trophy for everyone today. But just like my last season, uh, my husband had a sudden inspiration, a repeat ACG, 
at this time I had a sudden inspiration, me myself. I said, well, just do easy, just repeat ECG because the patient, the patient was referred to me that this is a uh, referred ECG. So why not just repeat another ECG? Now, this is this is the this was the ECG belong to the same patient. Now, uh, in case you haven't got the diagnosis for this ECG, this is left on the branch block. Same patient. Question it. How can it be? Is totally totally different from the referring ECG. So you can say that the referring ECG has been labeled uh, with the wrong name, but the patient was very sure I was carrying it. I was the only patient in the clinic. It couldn't have been wrong ECG given to me. Now, if you put them side by side, you discover something really interesting here. Now I want you all to pay attention to the T wave vector. Vector means direction either up or down on the so-called the narrow QRS ECG on your left hand side and the QRS complex vector, no, not T wave anymore, the QRS complex vector direction on the broad complex ECG. Now, let me show you. Look at V1, V2, V3. QRS first. QRS direction, down, down, down. Look at the T wave on your left hand side, the so called the narrow QRS ECG, T wave vector down, down, down. If you look at on the limb leads, lead one, two, and three, QRS complex up, up, down, up in one, up in two, but down in three. Look at the T wave in limb leads, up, up, down. Hey! Something interesting is going on here. It seems that the T wave wants to follow the QRS complex vector. What is this? The T wave follow and remember the directions of a QRS complex while in left by the branch block. This is called a phenomenon called T wave memory. Not only that, if you look really closely, into the heart rate per se, when the patient is in normal QRS complex ECG, the heart rate is around 70 beats per minute. You can calculate yourself here. I've calculated for you. And when the patient is in broad complex ECG, the heart rate is at 90 beats per minute, which means that this patient has a relatively rare condition called acceleration dependent left bundle branch block. What does it mean? It means no good for the patient. I did an echo on the patient. The patient has an ejection fraction of 35%. No wonder she's complaining of reduced effort tolerance. Uh, dilated LV. And uh, she had a normal coronary angiogram. So the final diagnosis is non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy with underlying acceleration dependent left by the branch block. Now, this is a mouthful of diagnosis. So for your take home, you just label it as heart failure. It's a heart failure. She has got T wave memory following in, uh, during normal QRS conduction because T wave always follow the direction of a QRS complex during left by the branch block. Then you must say that, well, heart failure, oh, so what? No big deal, right? Heart failure. I see a lot of heart failure patients. No big deal. Unlike cancer, cancer is the end of the day, man. End of the world. If you've got cancer, then the patient will say, oh my goodness, man. Heart failure, makan ubat saja. Take medicine only, man. Okay. But, guys, mortality, according to this paper, following admission for heart failure, only second to lung cancer. In fact, majority of malignancies, they have better survivability when compared to heart failure. Heart failure is really a sinister disease, a malignant disease. So take home, ladies and gentlemen, we should pay attention to the vector of T-wave inversion in a seemingly calm, normal looking ECG, but really suspenseful. 
consider T wave memory as the only clue to underlying cardiomyopathy. Because cardiomyopathy or heart failure kills, early diagnosis and treatment is the key. By paying attention to the uncanny T, ladies and gentlemen, you may save a heart failure patient's life today. Theorem number two, asymptomatic Q waves could be benign and positional related. You can use this maneuver, the magic wand, inspiratory maneuver to further help you with the diagnosis. Last but not the least, I think at the end, amidst all the confusing criteria you use to diagnose a pathological Q wave, you must take into context with patient's full clinical profile. And this is really the key of uh, looking at the Q waves. And number three is, don't think an isolated Q wave in lead three is all the way benign. There may be dangers lurking beneath the serenity, beneath the clear water. And in this case, I've clearly shown to you that this isolated Q wave in three is in fact the only sign of a special form of pre-excitation syndrome in that particular patient. Again, I will end by saying that it's important to give correct treatment to the patient because you spare the patient of the unnecessary long journey of a quest for a cure if you do that. And that quest can be very, very long. With that, I thank you very much for your kind attention.